than get with Shana. Amen. Tony, come on up. Give, give Mr. Mr. Cook a big hand. It's always good to have you. Thank you, sir. Good to be here. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to be back. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Um, Jesus said, if you bring a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, you'll not lose your reward. Thank you. I sure love and appreciate uh, the church here in uh, Warrington and appreciate Pastor Terry. He just did an interview. Uh, I interviewed him a few weeks ago and about his experience at Asbury and uh, just not only having gone to school there, but also the revival. And uh, we had like 450 people listen to that just within a few days. I haven't checked lately, but uh, your pastor is full of wisdom and uh, a lot of great respect, and uh, it's just always an honor to be here with you. Um, I, if you happen to be new and, and all that, I've been here, I think, every year for many years, and uh, my wife and I are coming up on our 44th wedding anniversary, and uh, thank you. And I spent uh, 18 and a half years, actually 22 years, in supportive roles of ministry, much of that at Rhema. For the last 21 years, my wife and I have traveled full time. We've been in 31 countries, 47 states, and we love Jesus and we love what we do. And it's great to be with you. Before I jump into the message, I wanted to share just a, a picture to let you see a couple of the things that uh, we've been able to see happen lately. Did those pictures make it over from Wentzville? Did they make the transition? Let's see if... They show up here in a second. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the book on the left, we ha I have 15 books that I've written over the years. Uh, the book on the left is uh, called In Search of Timothy. It's about uh, teamwork and, and churches and uh, people partnering with their pastor and serving God and so on. And it just went into the Turkish language. That's what's shown there. And it went into Turkish about two weeks before the big earthquake just happened. I'll be heading there this summer uh, for a conference, and um, we've got uh, that book. Now it's being done in um, uh, Hindi and Nepali as well, and I, I believe our books, are that's going to take our foreign translations up to about 15 different languages. And then the book on the left, it's very hard to see because of the size, but that is our book called Life After Death, rediscovering life after the loss of a loved one is to help people when somebody they love has died. And uh, that's, that translation that is being held there is in Arabic. And we have 21,000 of our books, four different titles circulating throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa. And uh, this particular book uh, is one of those four, but they're printing 10,000 of those to flood into a uh, northern African nation that is 99.9% .9 Muslim, and those will be uh, distributed heavily in that nation. We also just had that book go into Hungarian, and the publisher there is a lady who actually serves as a hospital chaplain, and so she's gotten 1,500, uh, 1,500 of those into various Hungarian hospitals, and the chaplains are giving them out uh, to people who've had loved ones die, and the report that I'm receiving is that it's especially appreciated by people who don't know the Lord, who are finding help and hope and, uh, you know, that type of thing. So that's just a little, these are all reports from within the last couple of weeks, and so um, I believe, and I know your pastor believes this too, that uh, we are due an outpouring from heaven and uh, the Bible says that uh, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And so I know you guys are a very missions-minded church, and uh, so it's always a joy to come and, and hang out with Pastor Terry, but to be with you. Uh, I want to share a scripture with you here at the beginning of this message. Um, it is from 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, Peter makes an amazing statement. He, he tells the uh, Christians uh, in multiple congregations, in multiple churches, he says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Now, just that phrase right there, you are living stones. Um, you may not feel as alive as you did before the clock 
you know, did what it did, moved, jumped ahead, I guess we sprung forward um, with a, an hour less sleep. But spiritually speaking, we are living stones. Uh, there's life on the inside of us, uh, but we're not just isolated stones by ourselves, uh, but we are being built into a spiritual temple or a spiritual house. And in order for a stone to become part of a house, Number one, it has to be gathered with other stones. And that is why gathering is so important. The Bible says to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's one thing to be a living stone, but it's another thing to be built into a spiritual house. For a stone to be built into a house, not only does it have to be gathered, but maybe some of the rough edges have to be knocked off. Um, does God do that in our lives sometimes? And, you know, we've got traits or, or whatever that are uh, problematic and, and God helps get our life where uh, we get along better with others, we become a peacemaker instead of a troublemaker, things like that. And, uh, and, then, and then those stones have to be joined together in a meaningful way. And so I believe it's the, uh, in, in a natural house you have mortar or some adhesive that joins the, the rocks together. In, in the church as we're built together into a spiritual house. I believe it's the unity of the Holy Spirit, uh, the fellowship and so on that joins us together. We're united around a common purpose, around a common belief, you know, our belief in Jesus, our belief in the Word of God, our, our reception of the Holy Spirit in our lives that joins us together and we become living stones who become then a spiritual temple. But Peter's next statement is what I really want to focus on. He says that um, you are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Every believer, and this is what we're going to zero in on today, every believer is a priest. We're a spiritual, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Most believers really maybe don't hear too much about that. They don't think about being a priest. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid growing up, I didn't grow up in a, in a church that even had priests. I grew up Protestant, and so we had a, a pastor. Um, but this idea of a priest, somebody who has some kind of special privileges that you don't, somebody who has access to God that you don't, and I, but I applied that priestly mentality as a little kid growing up to my pastor. He had some kind of special status with God that I did not have. I, he was an insider. I was an outsider. And, and I want to make very clear, I thank God for pastors and teachers and prophets and apostles and, and all, but, but all of the fivefold ministry gifts uh, but, but they are still believers. Uh, as, as a Bible teacher, I'm still a believer. I don't have any privileges in Christ that you don't have. That doesn't mean I don't have a function and a role, but my role is not to be somebody else's priest, uh, to be your access to God. I, I hope this morning that you did not get up and, and, and in your prayer time say, Father, I now come to you in the name of Jesus and in the name of Pastor Terry. You know, Pastor Terry is your pastor, but he's not your priest. You have access to God through Jesus. Now, Pastor Terry is still vital. He's still very important. Uh, pastors head up the church. They lead. They teach. They guide. They direct. Um, they're very, very important. But as a pastor, as a Bible teacher, uh, Pastor Terry's job and my job is not to be your link to God. It's to point you to your link to God. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Pastor Terry's job, my job, is not to be your mediator or your bridge to God, but our job is to point you to Jesus who is your link. I remember Pastor Terry, somebody once said to me, and, and I, don't, I don't mean this to make fun because I know they were very distressed and they were very troubled at the time, but this individual said to me, Brother Cook, you are my only hope. And I thought to myself, I didn't say it, I thought, you are in real trouble. 
if I am your only hope, that means Jesus, poor Jesus can't help you. It's, it's down to me. And, and I, let me just tell you, I make a really bad savior, okay? I make a really bad Holy Spirit. Now, hopefully, you know, he can work through me and things like that. But, uh, but Jesus is our mediator. And, uh, but, but because he is our high priest, uh, we are priests under him. But I grew up with this mentality that the preacher had kind of this special relationship with God that I did not have, that he had some kind of access or privileges. And, um, and when you think about it, let, let's pop a picture up here real quick if we could um, of what people think of. Now, when you think of the Old Testament, I think that's a pretty cool picture. When you think of the Old Testament, this is what you think of. And the priest of the Old Testament, how many of you know we're not in the Old Testament? We have a totally different, how many of you know Jesus changed everything? In the Old Testament, only the priest could go in to what was called the holy place in the tabernacle or the temple. Now, there were a whole bunch of priests that would stay outside the temple or the tabernacle, and they would offer up animal sacrifices. That's where blood was shed and, you know, that type of thing. That was to portray that someday would come the true Lamb of God by whose death the sins of the world would be taken away. But inside the temple, we have this other picture, they would go in uh, one priest in the morning, and one priest in the evening got to go inside the temple or the tabernacle in the holy place and offer up incense. Now, in Jesus' day, there were 18,000 priests. Stop and think about that. 18,000 priests. And they had them divided into 24 groups. And if you were a priest in Old Testament times, uh, you would only go to work at the temple two weeks out of the year. The other 50 weeks, uh, you were doing something else. If you were a priest, you only worked two weeks out of the year. And, um, and, and you're only a priest if you were a male descendant of Aaron. In other words, most people were of the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Dan or Naphtali. They had the 12 tribes. Only the tribe of Levi and only those who were physical descendants of Aaron, male descendants with no physical defect, could be a priest. You know what that means? That means hardly anybody ever got to go inside the temple. And, and um, uh, we have another picture here of Zechariah. Um, Zechariah the priest, if we could pop to that picture... Real quickly, one day Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week as was the custom of the priests. He was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. And while the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. See, this is a picture from the Old Testament, how the system was before Jesus died and was resurrected. One priest a day got to go into the holy place. I'm not talking about what's called the holy of holies. That was one day a year. The high priest got to go in there. But, but to go into the holy place, one priest was chosen every day. Do you know what that means? The vast majority of believers, even in the Old Testament, never got to go into the presence of God, and most of the priests never even got to go in. They had to be chosen by a special lottery to get to go into the holy place and burn this incense. So what that means is, in the Old Testament, most everybody was an outsider, Nobody had access to the presence of God. It was just, you know, just the occasional priest that was fortunate enough to get chosen on a particular day. And once they were chosen to go in once, they could never do it again in their entire lifetime. So when Peter tells every Christian, you are a holy priesthood, boy, that communicates how much things have changed. 
And we should not have an Old Testament mentality where we think, well, the, the vast majority of us are outsiders. You know, we, we don't get to get close to God. Only a couple of really holy, special people get to be close to God. That's just not the way it is anymore. When Jesus died and rose again, it changed everything. When, when the Holy Spirit came, uh, it changed everything. When we began to be born again, it changed everything. Today, and, and that's why there's no sacrificial system anymore. There doesn't need to be any sacrificial system anymore. Jesus has died once and for all. There's no special building with a special holy place that only a select person can go. Every single believer is invited into the presence of Almighty God to enjoy the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not only are we told in the, in the book of Hebrews that we can draw near to God with a heart full of assurance, but we actually have Him on the inside of us. If there is a holy of holies today, it's the heart of every believer where the presence of God dwells. The Bible talks about Christ in us, the hope of glory. The Bible says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are not outsiders anymore. We don't have to stand at a distance. We don't have to be like the people in Zechariah's day where the great crowd was standing outside while one person went in and uh, offered up, you know, the, the incense, the fragrance, and so on in the holy place. Let's look at another statement that Peter made. We looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Well, in verse 5, he said we're a holy priesthood, but now he says we are a royal priesthood. Did you know that you have royal blood in your veins? Not physically, you have regular blood in your veins, but spiritually speaking, we are royalty. We are kings. This is what he says. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So Peter says we are a holy priesthood, we are a royal priesthood, and then the apostle John says this in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, he says that Jesus has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So we have solid New Testament uh, truth that communicates to us that we are priests unto God. Um, when we begin to look at what this means, and, and so, I mean, if we just stopped right here and, okay, you could leave and say, okay, well, I, I, they told us today that we're priests, so... What does that mean? I want to give you a definition. And then we're going to look at what our priesthood looks like in practice. Here's our definition. The priesthood of the believer means that we all have the privilege. Everybody say privilege. We all have the privilege of accessing the presence and blessings of God as well as the responsibility. Everybody say responsibility as well as the responsibility of sharing and conveying those blessings with others. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And when you look at the Old Testament priest, they, they had kind of a two-way function. They represented the people to God, and they represented God to the people. Stop and think about that. They represented the people to God, and then they represented God to the people. Now, we are priests, and it's very true that you don't have to pray, you know, Father, in the name of Jesus and in the name of my favorite TV preacher, you know, or to get access to God. Jesus is the only name you need in prayer. But we do have 
uh, this responsibility of representing Jesus to the world. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, there's a phenomenal verse here that really communicates about what it means to be a priest as a believer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it says, Now he uses us. Question, do you allow God to use you? Are you a vehicle? Are you a means of expressing him? He uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. When you hear that word sweet perfume, you don't, you don't have to think feminine or anything. But you remember the priest standing in, in that smoke? When that priest would burn incense on that altar, representing the praises of God's people, the prayers of God's people, the worship of God's people, when that fragrance from that incense would rise up, the room would be filled with that smoke that smoke would just saturate the priest's robe, his hair, any kind of turban that he had on his head, his beard. Everything about that priest would get saturated with that fragrance. Well, the Bible says that God uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. And then he says our lives are like a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Beautiful picture, beautiful imagery. Um, I, I can ask you this, you know, maybe before you uh, were walking with the Lord, maybe you spent some time in some smoke-filled rooms that were not like the temple of God, okay? Um, you know, you were in a bar, or a pool hall, wherever, uh, some kind of club or something or other, and, and whatever permeated the atmosphere of that room, whatever smoke it was, that, that saturated into your clothing and into your hair and everything else. When you left that place, if that was a place you weren't supposed to be and, you know, you came across somebody and they took one or two sniffs of you and they said, where have you been? And you, oh, nowhere. I haven't been here. Well, they know you've been somewhere. They can smell that, that fragrance permeates everything about you. And I'm going to tell you what, if you spend time with God, if you spend time with God personally, if you spend time with God, with God's people, then you begin to pick up a spiritual aroma. There's something different about you. It can, it can be reflected in your countenance. Uh, it just, it may not be a physical, tangible, you know, something that people could smell, but, but spiritually speaking, there's something different about you. What I want to do is take just a couple minutes and I want to share with you a few ways that you and I function as priests. I, was, I shared this message a while back at a church in Colorado and, and uh, my wife happened to be with me on that trip and, and she was standing back at our book table and, and she told me later, she said that two little old ladies walked by, she said they were about 85 and she said they were just having the sweetest conversation and the one lady said to the other, She's, I just preached this message, and the one lady said to the other, she said, I've been in church all my life, and I didn't know until today that I was a priest. And that just made my heart glad because, you know, I mean, I wish she'd found out much earlier, but just reading the New Testament, we are priests. And, and religious tradition and, um, and religious ideology has caused believers to feel like they're some kind of outsider and that somebody else has some kind of special inside connection, inside relationship with God. You know, I love and appreciate Pastor Terry and I believe God called him, raised him up to be a pastor, to be a leader. You know, I, I believe that God gave me a call to be a teacher and things like that. But your pastor and I, we don't have some kind of special secret handshake with God that gives us some kind of special, you know, access to God. God hears you when you pray in the name of Jesus, just like he hears Pastor Terry and I when we pray. Uh, we may have responsibilities in terms of teaching and leadership, but when it comes to priesthood, we're all on common ground. And, and that doesn't mean we don't have authority in the church or structure in the church or job descriptions in the church. The fact that we're all priests 
doesn't mean that we can all do the same thing functionally. I'm a priest unto God, just like you're a priest unto God, but you don't want me to decide all of a sudden, well, I want to sing a solo. I'm not gifted to do that. It would, it would be a really painful, horrible experience if I did that. But I'm a priest, okay? So, so I want to tell you five things, very quick, very simple, of what do you do now that you're a priest. I don't want you to leave this morning and just say, well, I'm a priest and not know what to do with it. I want you to know how to function in your priesthood. In other words, we're going to answer the question, what do priests do? What do priests do? Because you're obviously, as a priest, you have some functions. You have some responsibilities. Number one, we function as priests when we offer our very selves, including our bodies, to God. We function as priests when we offer our very selves, including our bodies, to God. Now, if I was a priest in the Old Testament and you were not a priest, then you would bring an animal to me. Probably, you know, depending on your income, it could be anything from a turtle dove to a heifer. And as your priest, I would receive that uh, gift from you. I would have certain, th I would have to, you know, kill it, get the blood out. The blood would be poured out. And then we would put that on this big, you know, barbecue pit, for lack of a better word, and that would be roasted and offered up to God as a sacrifice. See, that's all really impersonal. You bring a lamb, and, you know, I throw it up, kill it, throw it up. It's pretty impersonal. It's kind of a transaction. But in the New Testament, it gets real personal. See, you don't have the luxury of just going and getting a, a lamb and offering it up. God says, I want you to bring your own body, and I want you to make it not a dying sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. That's powerful. You know, I, I've done this many times, and, and Pastor Terry, I don't know if you've done this or not, but sometimes, you know, at the end of a service, we're inviting people to give their lives to Jesus and I will say, I know what I mean, and I assume people know what I mean, but I'll say, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, you know, I want you to accept Jesus, I want you to give him your heart. But in reality, if I look at that, I, I can kind of say, maybe I'm not communicating really clearly because God doesn't just want your heart, he wants your heart, your mind, your soul, your emotions, your intellect, he wants your body, he wants your checkbook, your, your, he wants, he wants uh, your social calendar. God wants you to give yourself to him in the entirety of who you are, in the entirety of your being, it, everything that you are and everything that you have, God wants you to offer it to him in surrendered worship. God wants you to have an entirely consecrated life unto him. And, and here's what the Bible says, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, I urge you, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Everybody say mercy. See, none of this would be happening if it weren't for God's mercy. Because see, you didn't become a priest because you're so awesome. I didn't become a priest because I'm so wonderful. We became priests because of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The common English Bible of that says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. So in the Old Testament, priests offered sacrifices. In the New Testament, priests offer sacrifices. It's just that in the New Testament, the sacrifice you offer up is your own self. You place your, your whole person on the altar in surrendered worship unto God. Number two, we function as priests 
when we worship, praise, and pray. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, let my prayer be as the evening sacrifice. Well, if you don't know the Old Testament, you don't realize there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. And in each of those, a priest would go into the temple, the the specially selected priest that, that day would go in and offer up this sacrifice to God, fragrance, uh, incense, you know, that type of thing that we saw earlier. Let my prayer be as the evening sacrifice that burns like fragrant incense, rising as my offering to you as I lift up my hands in surrendered worship. Well, see, in, in the New Testament, we don't necessarily have any literal incense But our prayers are as an incense unto God. Our worship is as an incense unto God. And what makes this passage so interesting is that David is the one who wrote Psalm 141, and David was not a priest. David was, anybody know what tribe David was from? The tribe of Judah. Jesus descended from the line of the tribe of Judah. David was from the tribe of Judah, so he was not a priest. He was not a descendant of Aaron. He was not of the tribe of Levi. So why is David using priestly terminology, language that a priest would relate to when he's talking about his own prayers? I think he was having a little bit of a foreknowledge, a foreshadowing of the fact that when all of God's people pray, it, it's, it is as a, an incense. It is as a fragrant offering being rendered to God. In Acts chapter 13, this took place in Antioch. Uh, Antioch is in modern-day Turkey, and that's where a good friend of mine uh, was ministering prior to the earthquake in Turkey. That city today, it's called Antakya, was just totally devastated. And I was scheduled to preach there in August. I'm still going to go up and preach near Istanbul. I don't know that there's going to be any groups there in August, so if I'll go if I can. But but this is the earliest place where believers were called Christians was in Antioch. Today it's 12 miles from the Syrian border. And um, when believers, Paul and Barnabas and a few others were gathered there, it says in Acts 13 too, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This is where the first mission, formal, strategic missions to the, to the Gentiles was launched from this city of Antioch. And I want you to know when the Holy Spirit spoke, The Holy Spirit spoke as they ministered to the Lord. I'm just like anybody else. I I want the Lord to minister to me. How many of you like it when God blesses you? When God, you know, just visits you with his presence and with encouragement and the, the word comes to you, the spirit, the anointing, all those things. When God ministers to you. But what happened here, the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord... Well, ministry to the Lord can be prayer, but, but not all prayer is ministry to the Lord. Sometimes when we pray, how many of you in recent times have said, God, I need this, and told God what you need? Let me see your hand. You've told God you need something. Do you know what? That's perfectly legitimate. Uh, Philippians 4 talks about that, telling God what you need. Mark 11 talks about Uh, what things soever you desire. There's nothing wrong with praying about needs you have, but I hope that's not the only time you talk to God. Here, they weren't asking God for something, although there's a time and a place for that. Here, they were ministering to the Lord. They must have been telling Him how wonderful He was. They must have been praising and honoring Him. And it was when they ministered to the Lord that he spoke to them. Do you know prayer is really supposed to be a two-way street, not just a one-way street? 
They ministered to the Lord and fasted. So I believe that is functioning as a priest when we worship, when we praise, and when we pray. Number three, we function as priests when we serve. We function as priests when we serve. You know, a great church like this does not exist because one guy gets up and preaches a sermon. You know, Pastor Terry will be the first one to tell you that this church has its quality because many, many people roll up their sleeves and pitch in and help. You know, it, it takes people cleaning the building. It takes people caring for the children. It takes people running the audio and the video. It takes people who have musical skills and abilities. You know, stop and think about all the outreaches you do, things that you do to serve the community. This church is a great church because many people use their time, their talent, and their energy to, to uh, represent God, to let the love of God flow through them in serving one another. But how many of you know the Bible says that whatever we do, we're supposed to do it as unto the Lord? And I believe that when we serve, that, that we're really functioning as a priest. Let me give you an example. In John chapter 12, I think this is one of the most beautiful uh, passages of Scripture that we have. In John chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume. Now, how many of you guys have ever shopped for perfume for your wives? Any of you guys ever done that type of thing? They don't sell expensive perfume today in 12-ounce jars. You know, uh, if you get a 12-ounce jar of perfume that's going to last your wife 40 years, you know, it's, not, it's typically not an expensive perfume. Expensive perfume comes in super, super micro, tiny bottles. But back in Jesus' day, this was a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume. It was no doubt oil-based. And um, we actually find out later in John chapter 12 that the cost of this equaled a year's wages. So whatever, I don't know what an average wage is today, what an average person makes per year, but a whole year's worth of wages for an individual is what this perfume was worth. She took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house, the house was filled with the fragrance. See, one of the reasons why this picture is so beautiful is this is, I mean, it's clearly a picture of, of, of extravagant devotion. And Jesus had come into this house, and, and, and probably they had had the normal customary. Do you know what people would do, what was common hospitality in, in this part of the world in that day and age? Uh, when all the roads were dusty and everything and people were wearing sandals, when you went into somebody's house, what was the first act of hospitality that would be given? Washing of feet. And there would be, if, if, the, if the household was, you know, well-to-do and had some kind of servant, um, the servant would take, what, what would they take? A basin of water and a towel and they would, you know, a person would sit down, they'd wash their feet, dry it off with a towel. That was basic hospitality. That was hospitality 101. And we're assuming that had already taken place. But what we're seeing here is, I call it hospitality on steroids. It wasn't a basin of water that was worth, you know, a few shekels. This was a, a full year's wage, the value of this perfume. It wasn't a basin of water. It was very costly perfume. There was no towel involved. Mary used her hair after she poured this oil out and, and anointed his feet with oil. She used her hair to wipe his feet. This is... This is way beyond basic servanthood. This is extravagant, devoted, 
uh, and Jesus said it was an act of devotion to prepare him for burial because he was going to be dying not, not far off from this. Stop and think about Mary. She would have carried that fragrance. Notice, notice that it says that the house, the house was filled with the fragrance. When a person serves with extravagance, when a person serves with devotion, not only is the person affected by that, but it fills the house with a fragrance. You know, when love motivates... Now, now, people can do all kinds of things mechanically, just go through the motions, and, and there's not necessarily any love expressed. But when love is expressed, when devotion is expressed, it fills the house with something. When, when Christians are loving each other, praying for each other, they care about each other's needs, they, they uh, bear one another's burdens, they serve, they use their gifts to serve and to help, the house gets filled with the fragrance. Now somebody might say, well now, if Jesus himself were to walk in here, well I'd do something extravagant for Jesus. But you know what Jesus said? He said, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, You've done it unto me. When you serve in the house of God, Jesus treats it as though you're doing it for him personally. And there's a fragrant, because serving is a priestly function. It's not just a carnal, you know, well, I'm just going to sweep the carpet. No, we're, we're taking care of the place where God's people meet. The, the attitude of the heart is so significant here. Paul said, if I give all of my possessions to the poor, now that would impress people, right, if somebody gave everything they had away. If I, Paul said, if I give all of my possessions to the poor and even surrender my body to be burnt as a mar martyr, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. So it's not just the action of serving, it's the heart and attitude and motive behind the serving. The reason, I mean naturally this is a natural fragrance, a natural aroma, but what this sets before us is an example of Mary who was not a priest, but doing something that was kind of priestly. The anointing oil, that was something that the priest handled inside uh, the temple. So we function as priests when we serve. Number four, we function as priests when we give. Thank God for faithful Christians that are faithful to support their local church, bring their tithes and offerings into the storehouse. Paul, one time in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, talked about a financial gift he had received from a church. In Philippians 4.18 he says, For I've received the gift you sent by Epaphroditus, and I viewed it as a sweet sacrifice. That's priestly language. I've received your gift as a sweet sacrifice, perfumed with the fragrance of your faithfulness, which is so pleasing to God. And, and really, this parallels the serving. You can serve without your heart being in it. And people can give without their heart being in it. But when love motivates, when devotion, adoration of God, honoring God is the basis for your serving and your giving, there's a fragrance that is released. Don't you love that phrase, the fragrance of your faithfulness? You see, as Christians, we're not just called to go through the motions of praying and, and worship and serving and uh, giving and things like that. We're called to do it from the heart because we know our true identity. We are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. 
And because we are priests, we surrender our lives to God, including our bodies. We pray and we worship and we praise. We serve and we give, not just because we're checking off you know, a checklist of our duties and obligations, but because we love God with all of our heart, we're doing these things, and when we do them that way, they become priestly activities. Number five, number five, we function as priests when we share Jesus. We function as priests when we share the good news. That's what evangelize mean. It means to tell people good news. How many of you know this world needs good news? Romans 15, 16 says, He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, you, you may think, well, well, it's preachers. It, it's preachers that have the responsibility to share Jesus. Is it? Well, yes, we do. We have a responsibility, but do, doesn't every believer have a responsibility? Jesus said, you, talking to all believers, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Paul said to the Corinthians that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. As the church, we are representatives of Jesus Christ. You know, honestly, there will be some people that don't want to come hear a preacher because they, they have bad ideas about preachers or whatever, but, but we, every single one of us is a missionary, in a sense. Every single one of us... Uh, have, Jesus has said, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. And so when we share the gospel, this is notice what Paul said. He said, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering. So when you share the gospel with somebody, and they say, you know what, through your influence, they accept Jesus. And how many of you know, this is, this is, I want to stress this again, when we say we have a priestly duty, I don't mean we're pointing them to us. My job as a priest, relative to the world, is not to point people to me, it's to point people to my high priest. There's one God one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. My job as a priest is not to point people to myself, but it's to point people to our high priest, Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And when somebody accepts the gospel and we have the pri privilege of praying with them to accept Jesus, you know what happens? Their life becomes an offering unto God. They become a living sacrifice to God. So what are we saying? Very simply, let's look at the full list. Number one, we function as priests when we offer our very selves, including our bodies, to God. How, how many of you do that with some degree of regularity? You know, just every, maybe every morning when you get up, you say, God, here I am today. God, I'm yours God, I belong to you. God, my body is your temple. I'm giving you my body as a living sacrifice. Think through my mind. Speak through my mouth. Use my hands, my feet. God, my body belongs to you. When, when you consecrate and surrender yourself to God, you know, and, and we don't want to just say, well, I did that 30 years ago when I got saved. No, no, we want to live a consecrated life. We want to live a surrendered life to God. My wife and I are coming up on 44 years of marriage. What if I hadn't told her I loved her in 44 years? And on our 44th anniversary, she says, you know, Tony, you should, you should tell me you love me. And I said, honey, I did on our wedding night. I, I did it, you know, at the altar. I told you I loved you. If, if I change my mind, I'll let you know. You know, that, no, she wants to hear I love you often. She wants to hear, and she doesn't just want to hear I love you. She wants to see corresponding action. She wants to sense an attitude that reflects that love. Number one, we become, we function as priests 
when we offer our very selves, including our bodies, to God. And that means living a surrendered, consecrated life. Number two, we function as priests when we worship, praise, and pray. Number three, we function as priests when we serve. We function as priests when we give. And we function as priests when we evangelize. Now, somebody might say, well, Tony, those are just the, those are just the basic elements of a Christian life. That's, that's our point. Priesthood is not some mysterious, secret initiation thing. We're a kingdom of priests. We're a holy priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. And as we live a life reflecting love for God, every basic, every act of service, Every time we pray, when we periodically just say, Lord, I'm yours today, use me today. Um, when, when we give, just when we live the basic Christian life, some people could look at it as just checking off the boxes, but no, it's living a life surrendered and consecrated to God. You're a priest. As a priest, you have privilege and you have responsibility. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't think I was a priest. I thought the pastor, well, I mean, we don't call him a priest, but he's kind of like the priest. He's the one that has all the inside stuff. I want you to know there's no outsiders in God's family. We're all insiders. We all are called to draw near. We're called to be close. And what I'm saying doesn't in any way, shape, or form take away from people being gifted such as Pastor Terry to lead the flock, that type of thing, that's totally separate from our priesthood. But we, we are living stones. Every, pers- every believer is a living stone, and God is building us into a spiritual temple. That's so why we, we have an individual relationship with God, yes, but boy, we have to be connected to one another, especially in these crazy days that we're living in. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this church. Thank you for these believers that love your word and love your spirit. And Father, we just thank you. This is a place where Jesus is exalted, where his work is honored. And Lord, where your word is valued as being true. And so Lord, we thank you. Your word says we are priests, so we believe we're priests Uh, We have privileges according to your word, so thank you for helping us to walk in those privileges. Uh, Your word says we have responsibilities, so help us to live and to walk out those responsibilities and help us to do what your word says. Use us individually, use us as a family to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere. Let our lives be like a sweet perfume. Let our lives be a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. May our, our homes be filled with that fragrance. May our homes not be filled with, with strife and animosity and bitterness. And, but Lord, may the love of God so abound in our hearts that, that not only this house, this building, but our, 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 our own apartments, our, our, our homes, may they all uh, be filled with a Christ-like fragrance that's pleasing to you. Just with every head bowed and every eye closed, but before I turn this over to Pastor Terry, I want an opportunity to pray. There may be people here in this auditorium today that in a sense what I'm saying doesn't really apply to you because you've never taken that step of becoming a child of God. You don't become a priest unto God simply by being born naturally in this earth. You become a priest unto God by being born again supernaturally when you become a new creature in Christ, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. We've been talking about the fact that we're not outsiders, we're insiders, but but that really applies to people who have a relationship with God. Honestly, before we accept Jesus, uh, the Bible says we're, we're, we are outsiders. We're, the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, and sin does separate from God. So I just, wanna, I just want an opportunity to pray with people who, who would say to me, uh, Tony, I've never accepted Jesus. Uh, I, I've never asked him to be the Lord of my life. Um, 
I want you to know he died for you. Jesus died for you, shed his blood for you. He's been raised from the dead, but he's also a gentleman. He doesn't come barging into your life, forcing his way into your life. Uh, he, he invites, and, and, and the Holy Spirit would be knocking on anybody's heart. If you're watching online, this is you too. Uh, he, he invites and says, here, this is what I've done for you. I, I love you. I died for your sins. I shed my blood for your forgiveness. I've been raised from the dead. I'm alive. Jesus is alive. He's offering you the gift of eternal life, but he wants you to say yes. He wants you to say, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. I'm going to give you my life. How many people here today would say, and I'm going to ask you to lift your hand up in just a second so I'll know who we're praying for, but how many of you would say today with your hand uplifted in just a second, Tony, I need Jesus. I've, I've never accepted him as my Savior. Or you would say, Tony, man, I've been away from God. I've been doing my own thing. I'm like the prodigal son in the Bible that went out and was just living in disobedience and rebellion. I need to come back home tonight. Just how many of you, I'm looking all over this place right now, how many of you with uplifted hand would say, Tony, that's me on one of those invitations. Thank you, I see a hand way back kind of toward the corner a little bit. Thank you, there's a hand. I'm looking all over this place. There's a third hand over there. Thank you. I'm looking all over. How many, uh, how many others? Uh, I want to make sure I see you if that's you. God knows you, but I want to know who I'm praying for. Thank you, I see your hand right there too. I think we've had four different people raise their hand and say, thank you, there's a fifth and a sixth. Are there others with uplifted hand? Thank you, there's a seventh. Here's what we're going to do. And, and, and look, if I didn't, see you. God sees you. That's what's important. But um, I'm going to lead all of us in a prayer. There are seven people and maybe some online who are saying, Jesus, I need you. This is my first time to give you my life, to, for me to receive your life. And, and, or, or, or also perhaps saying, God, I've been away from you and I need to come back and rededicate. But I don't want these seven to pray by themselves. We're going to surround them with our faith and with our love. And we're going to pray with them. So I want everybody in this place, but especially those uh, who are saying this for the first time or rededicating their life. Let's all pray this out loud. Let it be from your heart. Say, dear God, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you love me so much. You sent Jesus to die for my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I surrender my life to him right now. And Lord, I give you my life. And, and I turn my life to you, God. Help me to live for you and to follow you and to glorify you all the days of my life. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. I receive your acceptance. I believe you have accepted me and you've made me a child of God. Thank you for helping me to live that out. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a hand to those that prayed that for the first time. <laughs> Pastor Terry, I'm going to invite you to come. I know you'll probably have something to say to them. If I can just say one thing. Number one, don't you love your pastor? <laughs> Pastor Terry and Miss Becky, thank you guys. How many, how many years have you been pastoring here? 38. 38 years. Amazing. So, and, and quality years. Good years. Um, I'll just mention this real quickly. I have a brand new book out, and what I shared with you just this session is like the first chapter of that book. It's called The End of Spectator Church, and uh, because once we get, uh, when we understand our priesthood, we can't be spectators anymore. We're participants uh, so we have a whole book back there called The End of Spectator Church. We just got it in our office like a week and a half ago. So I think you're the second church I've been at that's had access to it. And we got a whole bunch of other things back there. But give your pastor a hand of love and appreciation. <laughs> pastor Terry, love you. Thank, Thank you. God, love you. Thank you so much, Tony. 
Tony's one of the people that I go to for spiritual counsel. He's so wise, and so I ask him things. How many know I need some help? <laughs> so I just want to say thank you, Tony. By the way, uh, we're going to give an honorarium to Tony, but if you want to give monthly towards them or buy his material, we really encourage you to do that. He does a lot of missions work, and when you go overseas, it doesn't, it doesn't pay at cost. So anytime you want to give towards him, if you'll designate that, we'll pass it on. I'm going to ask the ushers to come on up. And by the way, I want to say thank you for your faithfulness. Our mortgage for all of our buildings, almost 17 acres and two buildings, two campuses, is under $667,000. I'm so thrilled it's getting eaten up quickly. And so thank you for doing your part. Anytime you want to designate towards that, we'll apply it. But that's so good. That is so cool. Everybody say amen. amen. Let's pray over this offering first. God, we worship you with our first and best. Thank you that you prospered us and we're able to give, Lord. Thank you for taking care of us as a family. Thank you, Lord, for providing for us. And as a church family, Lord, we thank you for that. We give you the credit for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and serve the people. While they're doing that, I will tell you that my daughter Jessica had a baby Thursday morning. We've got pictures. I was going to put it online, but there you go. <laughs> and so he is Elijah. He was seven uh, pounds, four ounces. And so uh, we are so excited. You guys know the story. I think Jessica had some issues medically where she was not able to have a baby. And they said, you got to go to a university hospital. And Washington University Hospital said, forget about it. We're not going to do it. And so she, we prayed. We didn't tell anybody. We just all were praying. And so she found a doctor who said, I can do that. And he did. And there's Elijah. Amen. But God gets the credit. I, I give the Lord the credit for that. It's wonderful. We're excited. Um, I wanted to also mention that there's a raffle going on for a servant's heart. Servant's heart does so much. And it's a fundraiser for a shed. And so that's back in the back, so please participate in that. And I know they've sold some tickets, but they've still got some to sell. Also, uh, if you're not involved in a band, a group of three, we encourage you to do that. Uh, I just read this week that one of the, the most important things in your spiritual growth is the two or three people that you hang out with the most. Isn't that amazing? The two or three people that you hang out with are determining your spiritual growth as much as anything in your life. And so our groups of three are groups of the same sex, three men or three women, could be two, could be five, somewhere in that range, who get together weekly for half an hour or so and just hold each other accountable. It is a tremendous, uh, what can I say, just speeds up the discipleship process. So I encourage you to do that. And also we have small groups, so please get involved in one of those because we want to help you. This is wonderful. This is some of the best teaching you heard this morning you'll ever hear. But even though you've heard good teaching, You've still got to get into a situation where you apply it, you have to know how to uh, give it application, and some other people can get into your face. Turn to somebody and say, I need somebody in my face. Now I say, but not you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's all stand up. And we are training, by the way, we're training people to do groups of three and small groups and even micro churches on a website that Tony put together called futurechurchleader.com. It's free on there. I just encourage you to go look at it. It's on YouTube at, at Future Church Leader. So, wow. Everybody say, wow. Wasn't that good this morning? You know, I knew, I knew that, but it fired me up in a new way, and so I'm so excited about that. How many of you know it's not really 11 o'clock like it says? <laughs> yeah. So go out and enjoy this beautiful spring day.